Hello and welcome to the BYU Library Family History webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on December 14th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation on British resources at Find My Past. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on Remember Pearl Harbor, Finding Your Ancestors in World War II Military Records. Before we begin, here's a little bit about James. James has over 40 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star Blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we'll turn the time over to James now. Okay, well, one of the things that's uh, not exactly coincidental because it, it, I had to plan it this way, but this webinar is on December 7th, which by the way is Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1941. So this, was going on in Pearl Harbor that many years ago. And uh, what you see on the screen. So this is, uh, it's very, uh, it's kind of a nice day to, to have a reason to remember what happened and all of the things that uh, occurred after that, including all of the World War II issues and what a tremendous, uh, Part of our history that is tremendous in the sense of being tremendous, just tremendously destructive. So let's get into this. We're going to talk mostly about the records that uh, we have for this. And the first thing we need to remember is that the St. Louis National per uh, Personnel Records Center burned in 1973, and that terrible pile of records are the service records for um, various individuals. So let's see what was destroyed in that fire in 1973. The Army personnel records uh, were those that were destroyed from around 1918, 1919 until from 1912, excuse me, to um, January 1st, 1960, and that's 80% of those records were lost. And then the Air Force personnel records from 1947 to 1964 were lost. 75% of those records were lost. Although those records were lost, that did not destroy, it destroyed a tremendous, it was a tremendous loss. This was, this is something that, um, uh, there's really no excuse for the loss because they should have begun the process uh, by the 1970s. They should have been in the process of dig digit not digitizing, but microfilming the records and carry getting those records off off uh, site. But uh, they, it was not done, and so there's a one of the larger losses of records. The other one, of course, is the is the fire that occurred in uh, in the 1890 for the 1890 census, but that's a whole nother story. And important thing to understand is that this was not all the military records and it and reconstruction of some of the records began immediately. And so there's other ways and, and I'll indicate uh, a lot of that information as we go along on how we, were, we can go about finding uh, military records. Uh, we're not going to focus entirely on on World War II. Uh, we're going to talk about military record. I'm going to talk about military records in general. So 
the first question, of course, is that whenever you start looking for a military record here in the United States, were your records destroyed by the fire? And so this is the exact um, extent of the records that were totally destroyed. So these records have been destroyed. And so if you fall into there, your person, your ancestor, your parents, whoever, fall into this particular category of having served in this time period, as did my great grand my grandfather, who served in the in the military for World War One. So from his service in the military and and uh, a different in another category, he also served in the military for the border war with Mexico, uh, which is known as, as the border war. So there's two different uh, conflicts that uh, my grandfather fought in. Uh, if you're wondering uh, why I'm talking about military records, uh, I was in the army for five years, for eight years, excuse me, for eight years. And I served as a military intelligence officer uh, during my part in the army. And basically all I did for as a military intelligence was to read and learn everything I needed to know about North and South America and Central America and South Central and South America primarily. But so basically we're um, this is something that I've uh, been acquainted with and have uh, uh, four years of, of military history and and uh, classes in the University of Utah. So a lot of my background is uh, military and I'm very familiar with the language and I'm very familiar with the records. About 16 million Americans served in World War II and that included about 350,000 women. And uh, just to give some idea, uh, it's estimated that around 407,000 people from the US uh, died and uh, there were about 12,000 civilian deaths. Um, and the total death count for all Americans was about 420,000. So there's were a lot of people. It was a very terrible war. It was a uh, tr had a tremendous impact on um, on the way people lived. I was born just right at the end of the war, and so I did not. Uh, I don't have any memories of being around during during that time period. But uh, it was a terrible thing, and and all the people that I knew growing up uh, had experiences and and related experiences that were war related. So the, the importance of military history and learning about the wars, uh, not only here in the United States that we're participating here, but in other countries, it's extremely important to um, uh, have that kind of a, of a background because if a person, and a younger person, and not necessarily younger, but older, uh, if they were even if they were civilians, uh, disappears, and there's a war going on, then uh, there's a pretty high possibility that your uh, relative or ancestor was involved in the war and uh, may have died in the war, uh, and that's you know that's very possible. And I, in doing research in England, for example, I very very frequently find. Uh, re references to people who died during World War II and during World War I, and especially with the bombing that happened in World War II in, in uh, London and around. There were lots of people, civilians as well as military people who were, who were killed. So the, it's, it's sort of a basic concept in genealogy that uh, knowing the history of the country, and that involves primarily in this case, knowing the wars that were fought and the battles that were fought, the conflicts that were that, that may have been there. And that will help to help to uh, give you some perspective when you start seeing people disappear off the record and you just can't seem to find any kind of further information. So it's a very good idea at that point to turn to military records 
and see what you can find as far as uh, discovering that person. This is especially true of younger people. So let's kind of look at the types of records. And this is just a partial list. This is the personnel record portion of a, uh, of a US Army record uh, dating from that particular time. Uh, this, these are records that have been around in the United in the America since the the, the basic uh, when the very early colonists came. Uh, there's been a series of battles and wars that are called uh, different types of wars that have been fought uh, almost from the time that the that the first English uh, European settlers came to America. Uh, until the present time. So we've we've had this whole long series of wars. And as we uh, all recognize now, there are at least two wars going on, uh, major conflicts going on right now as this particular presentation is being made. So what we have here is a personal record form. And uh, it, it's some of it is particularly... Um, I mean, it's easy to understand what all these things, some of these things are, but when you get into things like including DD form 214, uh, report of separation or equivalent, and you start to hear about uh, things like DA 1059, service school at, uh, academic evaluation reports, MOS orders, then it's a little bit... Uh, uh, Kind of, it seems a little a lot of, lot of jargon. And one of the things that's kind of the hallmark of all armies over the years has been uh, using acronyms for things and short uh, shorthand references. So you're really going to come into the situation where you need to have to spend some time online asking uh, questions about what these acronyms all mean. And when you get up. Uh, you can find a, a list. And so here I looked up all the acronyms in that particular personnel record list. And it's the OMPF is the Office of Military Personnel File. A T01 file is uh, the official military personnel file or the OMPF. And uh, the DD Form 214 is Department of Defense Form 214 is a certificate of release or discharge from active duty. And as you go down through the list, you'll find that every one of these, that, that these are all possible evaluations. Now, you may have noticed on the beginning slide that some of the information that I got in the, for this and the, some of the illustrations came from um, artificial intelligence, uh, particularly from the program that I'm using uh, more frequently than others is uh, Microsoft Bing Chat and uh, Microsoft um, Image Creator, and so using those, uh, I just barely, I just basically had to copy that discharge paper into artificial intelligence into a, a chat and ask them for ask uh, the Bing Chat uh, for. And if an, exp an expansion, an explanation of all the the um, acronyms that were in the original in the document that I showed previously, this one. So all of those, I just simply copied that document into uh, Bing Chat and came up with uh, a list of all of the documents, uh, an expansion of all of the acronyms. So. This is uh, the technology that's coming up is going to this is going to have a pretty good impact on trying to read re uh, uh, military records because you can just go uh, put them into something like being Chad or Chat GPT or one of the others and expand the language, tell them to explain all of the acronyms or all of the military uh, uh, terminology that's used in that. Uh, will give you a lot of information very, very quickly. Uh, but if you look at those records, you can begin to understand the uh, major challenges of understanding and using an individual's military records because it's going to have 
a lot of jargon and a lot of uh, terms that you may not be familiar with or understand the importance. So let's start with a draft, draft registration card. And this one <clears throat> is a draft registration card from uh, World War I, because you can see there it says men born on or after February 17th, 1897, and on or before December 31st, 1921. Well, uh, obviously, if they were born in 1921, uh, they did not fight in World War I, but uh, they used this form for uh, many years, and so it was the same form, even though some of the people were born after World War I had already ended. But this was the major um, uh, draft registration card that uh, was used for World War I. And if you want to, if you understand the importance of these uh, registration cards, is is an alternate way of having um, the uh, of, of a instead of a census record. This is sort of an alternate census record because virtually everybody, every male in the country, had to register for the for the draft. Uh, it didn't matter if they were blind, deaf, or dumb, they didn't, uh, did not, they still had to register. And uh, that didn't mean they were going to serve, or if they were even the right age to serve, but they, uh, they had to register. And this has becomes an invaluable record, because it's written out by the person in their own handwriting. And um, it's, uh, let, let's say the accuracy is 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 higher than some other records. It's it's more accurate that they would it's more likely that the person who was filling out a, a draft registration card would be accurate. Now, there are exceptions because there are people who didn't want to be in the army and so they may have not given the right birth date. And uh, there are others who wanted to join the army and they may not have given the right birth date. So it's not it's not uh, uh, exactly um, accurate always, but on the other hand, it does name the uh, a, a person, usually a relative, and uh, so it's kind of hard to. Um, uh, it's very also very difficult to find sometimes a parent's names or things, and this may be the only way to actually identify somebody. Now, in this case, it's a little bit interesting because the name of the person does not seem to be uh, the, related to the actual the person filling out the form. So that may give you a hint into someone that was uh, someone's related in some other way or uh, give you a person who may have known more information. So this is these are valuable records and I uh, used kind of routinely for finding, uh, uh, for instance, in African American uh, research. They are very helpful because many times they will take you back and identify a person who was uh, who was enslaved, who had been an enslaved person because of the eighteen ninety seven date, and and you and of course the eighteen ninety census is missing so that's the one and so this these to become even more important so you have the name here of the individual uh, you have the place of the residence of the individual um, telephone numbers aren't so helpful anymore uh, but age in years so that gives you an idea of the birth date but they're confirming there's a birth date it will also tell you where they were born uh, this is sometimes more, much more accurate when the person themselves is filling out the form than it was uh, for a census record of somebody who may or may not have known the place they were born. And the date of birth, uh, with the, the caveat that there's possibility that they weren't very forthright in their, in the time. Usually when they are, it usually only happened when the person was either one or two years off of 
of being either qualifying for, for active for military or not qualifying for the military. And I have found that the, um, although I didn't highlight it, I found that the occupation is also helpful in occasions because sometimes I can find records of the business or find it in a city directory or something and find the information that I need from uh, the draft registration. So there's there's just a lot of records that you could find that uh, if they were in the military during World War II, and I would add that that if they were in the military during World War I or any of the other wars, it's just uh, there's just going to be records. Now, the problem as you get too far back in American history is that um, the records become less and less definite. In other words, you may find a name, but you may find no other information about the individual. And you wouldn't have anything in the context that would tell you if you have the right name. But as you come forward then with the governments as they are, you would have more and more information and lots of paperwork. Um, my military file is about two or three inches thick. Uh, and I had just a lot of lots and lots of uh, paper from the government during the time I was I was in the military. So important to see that uh, a separation record, uh, meaning the last record in the uh, in the pile of records that were available for this individual, they may be the one that uh, has the most information. Why? Because it's cumulative of all the places where the person served and the time they served, and um, a lot about how they what they how they served in the and where in the uh, uh, in the army. So if we look at this record, for example, uh, from and these people aren't related to me particularly. I just they're just records that I found. And this one says that this person had dependents, so that we know that he, if you know his family, it could have been a family or it could have been um, someone else. But in the rest of the papers, if it would come along with this, then you would find that information. It said that he served in the Asiatic Pacific area and the Philippine Liberation. So he had a Philippine rib Liberation ribbon, one star, meaning he did something uh, that was noteworthy. And he had a victory medal, which everyone got. And, uh, and that was in the American theater. So he was, uh, so this person had, uh, uh, there's some information here. Um, he also tells the ships that he's that he served on, um, and uh, in this particular one, this was a naval service, so he was serving on a ship. So these are all. Uh, this is all interesting and valuable information about this individual to help us identify the person, but also to identify uh, where he might have been and uh, where he was, uh, where he was born and uh, his age and all of that kind of information. Uh, since uh, providing inaccurate information to the Army, Navy, uh, Marines, Air Force, or whoever uh, was uh, is a serious question and serious, in the, in the, meaning very serious, can end up having the person in, uh, put in jail. So you, you didn't want us, you didn't want to lie to the government and, and fill out information that wasn't correct here. Um, and it's very possible that uh, some of the information that you have about your ancestors' military service could be very uh, puzzling. And I kind of began my genealogical research into um, military intelligence. This, by the way, the picture here, just to identify as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. And, are off in Arlington, Virginia, across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. So here is, uh, was the question that I ran into that got me 
doing genealogical research into military records. My grandfather, his name was Leroy Parkinson Tanner. The question, did my grandfather serve in France during the World War I? In other words, what was his involvement in that terrible World War I war? Um, and uh, none of the stories, there was very little story, very few stories that came down. I did, my grandfather served earlier uh, before World War I in, uh, in a unit that was uh, assigned to the border between Mexico and the United States. And uh, so he was uh, uh, fighting there. I don't think there was any fighting because, we, but we can't find any. I can't find anything else about him very much in that. But my real question was: Did he actually fight in the war, or what happened uh, to him? Uh, this is him in his uh, military uniform, and uh, it's very apparent here that he was uh, a rank. He probably not just probably, but a very, very likely drafted into the army because he has no insignia on at this case. And so he is just a raw recruit. He's basically there just to start out. And the mystery, of course, was that his name did not seem to exist on military records. <laughs> so it was, uh, the question was, uh, he was supposed to have been in the army. He may have gone to France, but how did he get there? And uh, so we started with uh, his uh, draft registration record and uh, and tells where he was born. None of this information, by the way, was was a surprise to me because there was nothing here that I didn't already know and have information about as far as his family. But the question was, what was his relationship to the military and uh, the fact that he uh, was part of the draft, uh, the draft registration, and that uh, could have given him a way. But there is one very interesting uh, annotation that turns out to be something that is uh, very that is very significant, and. Um, it was says that he served as four years in the state of Arizona in the National Guard, and um, and he was uh, the branch is says he was is not readable down there actually, but it's uh, his rank and and branch are kind of mixed up there, so it doesn't say what he had, and uh, it just says he was in the National Guard. And uh, so that was kind of one clue that came about. <laughs> kind of fast forward to get through this. So you, you know, like this is not a, it was not, a, it was a great mystery because I couldn't find any information about him. And uh, I spent a great, uh, not a great deal, but I spent cons uh, consistent time trying to search through um, military records. And then what happened was that I inherited a huge pile of documents that were boxes and boxes of things that my father had. And uh, eventually going through those boxes, pile up, pile, up, pile, up, pile, I found all of my grandfather's enlistment records, all of the records that, that I had from him um, that, that had been, they'd been preserved. I, they were in the the answer in my father's pile of records, and so one of the most important things to understand from this example is that um, he was uh, that you need to start with your immediate family and your and your relative any relatives that you can possibly contact and make that known that you are wanting to find records about anybody in your family any kind of records and if you if you have the same results that i did my willingness to take the records and and work with them and and basically put them up on family search or other you know historically record them on a computer uh 
in, in a sense, I became the, the go-to place. So everybody who had original records that they didn't want to know what to do with would uh, show up at my doorstep and hand me a box. So that uh, happened from time to time over the years. And right now, it's still keeping me busy because one of my uh, family members gave me, in the last couple of years, uh, I've had two more huge boxes of records show up. So uh, it's it's interesting. It's beneficial, but it's also uh, it puts a great burden on a person to go through and find out what they all say. So in going through the records, interestingly enough, this is his enlistment records, and there's a notation on the enlistment record. It's notated that, um, it, and they had them sign on there if they would. Uh, uh, if they would be willing to go to uh, the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, and what happens if you look at that uh, is that he was he served there and was uh, put in there. Uh, this is his enlistment and, and not his, this is the record of his enlistment from the whole time. So he was there from in the, in the American Expeditionary Force, which is the one that went to Europe from October 13th of 2000, of 1918 to the 6th of June, June 3rd of 1919. So yes, he was in France, but no, he never saw action because he never, because the war, uh, basically was was winding down and was over so oops wrong direction so here's the vital information um and it gave him the ability um actually the whole time the information that i needed was staring me in the face uh from his from a grave marker uh, he had two grave markers. One was uh, a, a, tomb, a headstone or a grave marker that was put there by the family. And then in addition, you can learn that um, you can find the fact that veterans are entitled to a military grave marker. So uh, at the expense of the government. So basically this not anything really fancy, but this one told his birth date and his death date, and also said that he was a private in the 141st Infantry, 36th Division in the World War I. So we have a, uh, a, a exact record on this. Now, if I went to that, now the problem that I was having, of course, as I mentioned, is that uh, even though it says he was in the 141st Infantry in the 36th Division, his name doesn't show up. And the reason it did not show up was in that first document that I showed was that he was not actually in the army, in the, in the U.S. Army, although his records indicated that he was. It, he, he became part of the army because he was in the, um, was in, in the state, uh, whatever, the state militia or, or, um, National Guard that was in the for the state of Arizona. So uh, it's complicated how he got in, but it's not complicated when we got to the records. So what it, what I did from here is important uh, for finding more information about the person and what happened. And um, so what happened here is to go to uh, the military. Uh, unit histories it's kind of comprehensively you, you can i can i have found over the years that virtually every major unit in all of the u.s armed forces somewhere has a military history now a lot of the military histories previously were in uh, various locations around the country Many of those have now been uh, digitized. And I'll mention that the, one of the major 
uh, websites for digitizing military records is owned by Ancestry.com, and it's called Fold, F-O-L-D-3, Fold3.com. And Fold3 uh, is a subscription website, and it's separate from Ancestry. So even if you have an Ancestry site, you're not going to get a subscription to Full 3, but it is one of the larger collections of, of military records. But individual records like this one of the 141st Infantry Regiment were um, are not necessarily, they may be on Full 3, but they're not necessarily only on Full 3. There, there, many of them are, are digitized and unavailable from the individual, uh, from different like in this case, Texas Military Forces Museum. Uh, and so it's very possible to do research online and find uh, very specific records about the units and the activities of the of your servicemen. Um, you can see down at the very bottom, I don't know if it's visible on your screen, but it says the regiment sailed from New York on July 26, 1918, and got there on August 6th. Um, so basically, um, when we talk about Veterans Day in the United States, the Veterans Day originally was just was um, was established to celebrate the end of World War One, and so there's a very, it, although there is a specific date for the end of World War One, uh, that didn't mean that the soldiers left or got. In other words, the movement of the soldiers didn't have anything to do with that particular date. So you would find out whether he was there. But the one thing that was evident is that it, he never did get into the area where he would have been involved in the fighting. And the question here that also arose is that my grandfather lived, was born and lived in, in Arizona. Um, he died in New Mexico, but that was from a truck train accident. So he was not, uh, but his life was in Arizona. So how did he get to the Texas, uh, first Texas, uh, 101st U uh, U U.S. Infantry Regiment? Well, that came through the National Guard and his assignment and mobilization of that National Guard unit that put him into uh, World War I. So here is uh, what I mentioned is the um, is a web as the record set on um, family search for uh, headstone applications from 1925 to 1949. This covers uh, a lot of the time period of World War of the people going into and being in um, World War II. And there are almost a, a million image, uh, images in this particular collection. And uh, this is these can be very valuable because they can contain a lot of information. Um, in the case of, of uh, the application for my grandfather, uh, Leroy Parkinson, there was uh, a considerable amount of information. So here's the uh, here's the record uh, from. Family search and uh, the image of the original document is blown up here. It looks like it's got a lot of scribbling and a lot of uh, of different things on it. Uh, but if you very carefully examine this, what this one document showed was his entire military history. And on the backside was every place he served and all the different assignments he had uh, before he was discharged from the army. So this was uh, so you you could say well a lot of that information may have been lost in the St. Louis fire, but this one document has preserved uh, the the bulk of the assignments and doing research directly into the units and and the unit histories will give you fill in all the details. So you're going to be able to get um, all the information ultimately from, uh, from looking at some of these other records that are out there. So how do you know if there's a grave marker? Well, uh, that is the subject of online records that are um, 
readily available to search. There's the veterans uh, military cemeteries, veterans uh, websites that uh, talk about where all the records, where, where everyone's buried. And here on the back of that um, document that I just showed is the, the shorthand uh, explanation of when and where and how he was discharged uh, from the army. So even though that was all the questions, uh, uh, you know, I, I still had the question of what did he do and what did he do when he, how he got to the army. And so basically there were more documents and on the discharge document, um, it was like he was sent there, but it was only a few months later that he was sent back to the United States. So by the time he got there, it basically turned around and came back. So with all uh, research, um, you have to use a variety of documents and uh, a lot of online repositories and a lot of local resources, such as the cemetery headstone. Uh, some of those things you're just not you're not going to know about, and they're not going to be coming up immediately in in your searches. Uh, unless, um, unless you start doing this kind of collateral uh, search is during the time periods for other records that may have been preserved from either the family or from some of the other records. Um, so here was this, here's the um, Fold3 uh, Ancestry website. And uh, it that's the that's the name of it. it's fold3.com so it's not hard to find the the term fold3 uh perhaps uh, over your if you're familiar at all or if somebody in your family was in the military you've seen a, a flag that was folded until it was in a triangle shape um and that uh, that's called Fold 3, and that's what that reference is to. It's to the uh, flags that were used uh, to commemorate the, at the time of the death at the funerals of the military people. And if your ancestor or family member was or is in the military and dies, they uh, are entitled to a flag. And so that's that's part of the what the military offers here. And it, I might always have to mention that Fold3 has a separate subscription price from Ancestry. So if you need to get into these records, you're going to um, have a separate cost. They are available through the, from the Family History Centers. If you have a Family History Center near you, now called Family Search Centers, a family search center, then you would be, um, then you can use Fold3 for free. Um, my experience is that you don't get the full benefit of the programs um, from Ancestry or otherwise, uh, unless you have a subscription, however. And as I mentioned previously, almost every unit in the US Army has a unit history. And, um, if you look at uh, this, even some of these repositories for military history, you can begin to understand why I would say that it would be possible to reconstruct almost all the, the uh, activities of someone who was in the military when, uh, because of the, the vast number of records that have been preserved. So this Dwight, the Dwight Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas, has uh, 687 feet of over a million pages of military documents. And um, this is not the National Archives. This is, these are our military um, facilities. And they will, they, depending, whether all of those records have been digitized or not, or if they're searchable, but that you would have to look at the individual repository. 
So here's another example. This one's called the Ike Skelton Combined Arms Research Library. Um, and it is a, uh, a military website. And it has uh, all sorts of different uh, records in here. And it's a guide. This one is a guide to finding all of the records. And uh, it tells you primarily where those records are located um, and, uh, and how, the, how the, you can find those records. One of the things that about, about the military is that not only are there unit histories, but there are lots of other histories involved. And so when you're talking about military records, you're talking about the ability to, 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 to go to dive as deeply as you wish to get involved. One of my early most, uh, most complete involvements was with Civil War history and the United States Civil War. And uh, uh, when I was in high school, I had to do uh, was to, chose to do an article about one of the the Battle of Chattanooga and the in the U.S. Civil War, and found that uh, finding information about a specific back back then and uh, was uh, almost impossible. Actually, none of even the library in Phoenix, the big library, the Phoenix Public Library, and all this nobody had any information, and it was very frustrating uh, until after. Uh, the hundred years of the uh, the Civil War, and then books were published by the thousands. And so today, that's uh, you can find the Civil War day by day. As a matter of fact, it would tell you everything that happened during that that battle. Another place to look, and I think it's very important to to start here, as if you were going to, if you do, if you know nothing about the records. It would be extremely important to start right here with the Family Search Research Wiki, and this is the page for World War One United States military records. But you're going to find World War Two records also, and uh, there's information about where and how to find all of these different records. And don't forget hometown newspapers. <clears throat> Very important to to consult the newspapers where the people lived. Uh, the reason why that's the case is that uh, the, the newspapers wrote about the people and uh, there was nothing more interesting to the people in the smaller towns of America than to find out about their own boys working you know, in the army and what was going on. And so it was very often that you'd find that information. So, Further research about my grandfather um, in the in the local papers. This was he was he lived in a, a town in eastern Arizona called St. John's Apache County, but the the regional newspaper. This one was one of them. There is there was one in St. John's, but this is the Holbrook News, and this one gives a, a date and uh, an exact time and all of the people from uh, from Navajo County at the time uh, who were, uh, he lived in Navajo County at this time, were, um, were called up from that area. And so uh, finding his name on this list gives us a, a, a second date, a second uh, check date for his entry into the military and when that occurred. And the war was, was definitely raging over there in Europe in May of 1918. So here's kind of blowed up uh, kind of information. Uh, what happened here is that uh, this is the, the actual day of the week and the time that everything left and what they were doing and uh, the crowd of people leaving. And uh, uh, if with my experience and the fact that most of my uh, that all of my military service took place during the the Vietnam War era, I did not serve in country in Vietnam, but uh, <clears throat> I served in Panama, in the country of Panama, for two years. 
during the war. And I can assure you that there was not uh, uh, bands and patriotic pieces played while we were, we went in the army. There, most of the people were. Uh, and when we got out of the army, there was nobody that was really happy about uh, that we'd been in the army. Okay, well, thanks for watching. That's kind of an overview. And I would emphasize that um, the Family Search Research Wiki gives you an, a really good uh, entry into all of the various types of records. And uh, despite, uh, despite the way that, that uh, you may think of everything in terms of genealogy, uh, none of, nobody was worried about making military records into genealogy records. So the things that, uh, so you're not going to find them uh, as easily and as as uh, possible in, um, in from the standpoint of of looking in genealogical websites as you will if you get out and go on to the online websites and look for um, the information that you need to to find their military unit and the history and when they would have gone and always don't forget newspapers and other records that could be made. Uh, and records and all these records haven't changed. They go clear back into the colonial days in the United States. So don't don't think there aren't records. There are, and uh, there just may not be uh, tagged as genealogical records. They may be tagged as historical records, and they may be in university libraries or special collections libraries or specialized uh, military history museums and repositories. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on December 14th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation on British resources at Find My Pass. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.